Good morning, everyone. Thank you for joining us for Sardis Baptist Church Sunday School Bible Study. We'll be looking today at the April 18th study, and we are, have been and are today continuing in the book of Luke. Go ahead and get your Bibles, whatever translations you have there. Look for Luke chapter 20, and then in a few moments we'll get into that. We do appreciate you joining us, and if you have the opportunity and can, please join us live in our, in our sanctuary here for worship at 10 and Bible study at 8.45 to 9. And then we, we meet there. If you can uh, come, we're, we're spacing our chairs out, so we will have adequate space between chairs. You won't have to sit shoulder to shoulder. So please come when you feel like you can. We always open in our class with uh, a few moments of prayer. We have quite a list always, and the list changes, of course, as you would know, uh, and ours changes every, almost every Sunday, our list changes. Thankfully, we see some people that get much better, and then we see some people that have had accidents or gotten sickness that need our prayers, but prayer is always needed, even if you don't know the need, just remember your, your church family, remember your, your, your family, yourself, those that you know about, your friends and neighbors. But we need prayer for the world and the world leaders, our own nation's leaders, our state leaders, our community leaders here in Florida City, and our county leaders. So they all need wisdom, and they need your prayers to help them make good and sound decisions. So let's pray for those that we know about. There's many on our list. Some are physical needs. Some are spiritual needs. Lord knows every need. Thank, we can be thankful for that far better than we know them. We can hear about them, but we don't know the details. But God knows how to work, and that's what we're asking is for His intervention. Let's go to the Lord in prayer, and then we'll get right into our study. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you for our life itself. Lord, we thank you for saving us one day. Thank you that even as a child we could understand enough to know that we needed a Savior. We knew that we had already sinned. We knew that we needed to repent. We knew that we needed a Savior. We knew that you loved us. And Lord, we're thankful for your grace and your mercy. Thankful that you gave us that, that faith to walk out upon your promises and trust you and allow you to be our Savior and our Lord. Help us, Lord, each day that we realize you're the Lord and we're not, and we don't let us place ourselves on our own life's throne. Help us to place you there daily and to follow your leadership and not ours. God, we need your wisdom. We need it for our leaders all around the world. And we ask especially for our country, our county, our city. God, we ask that you just bless and touch. And Lord, for those that need salvation, I pray that you'd touch them with the Holy Spirit's tug. Let the Holy Spirit speak to them and encourage them. And I pray, Lord, that they would have enough faith. You would give them the faith to walk out upon that promise that, that you are the Savior of the world, Jesus, and that you want them to come to you. Thank you again for everything you've done. We'll thank you for the promises that we can see in the future. In Jesus' holy name, amen. All right, if you have your Bibles, you do want to look in Luke chapter 20. The focal verses would be 9 through uh, 19. <clears throat> the title of our lesson, excuse me, the day of the title of our lesson is Cornerstone. It is very important that we understand what a cornerstone is. And if, you, if you've been around any building much or you have been around... Uh, Several churches have a marked cornerstone that may say something about the date that it was built and a little bit about the church. But in this study of cornerstone, we're looking at the cornerstone of God's salvation plan. And when we look at that, I jotted down the question. It's for me, it's for you, it's for all of us to understand what or who is the cornerstone of salvation. And when we think about that, we'll have to understand that Jesus Christ was the promised Messiah. He is the Savior of the world. 
he calls people to himself today that they would recognize him as the Savior. And he would become their Savior and their Lord. But let's look into the lesson and the parable that he's teaching today. And as usual, he's got a fair-sized crowd around him now. And there, he's become very, very popular with the people in Jerusalem that we would call, you and I would probably say, the common people. But we want to read these few verses. We'll pause in between some of these thoughts and we'll di dig into them in detail. Now, first of all, let's read 9 through 12, and uh, we'll pause right there. Reading out of Luke chapter 20, verses 9 through 12, and I'll be reading out of the New King James. Then he began to tell the people this parable. And when Luke's speaking here and writing it down, he's talking about Jesus. When Jesus began to speak and tell the people, he told them this parable. A certain man planted a vineyard, leased it to vine dressers, and went into a far country for a long time. Now, at vintage time, he sent a servant to the vine dressers that they might give him some of the fruit of the vineyard. But the vine dressers beat him and sent him away empty handed. Again, he sent another servant, and they beat him also, treated him shamefully. And sent him away empty-handed. And again he sent a third. And they wounded him also and cast him out. And Jesus is telling this parable for everyone around to hear. But especially he's speaking it because of the Sanhedrin's presence there. And the Sanhedrin, if you don't remember, the Sanhedrin made it up of 71 members that met at Jerusalem and they were considered the Jewish Supreme Court of that day. Now, you think with me. Why was Jesus telling this parable and especially he wanted the Sanhedrin to hear? Well, as this parable unfolds, I think you and I both will understand even better. <clears throat> I want to go back to the Old Testament, way back into Isaiah, just for, just for a moment. Just for a moment. And we want to pick up a parable there. And we might begin to think that, hey, this is similar. Maybe there's something very similar here in Jesus' telling of a parable. But if you would, look with me back in Isaiah chapter 5. And I'd read the first, uh, let's see. I guess I'll read the first seven verses to make it hopefully clear and, and in total. Now let me sing to my well-beloved a song of my beloved regarding his vineyard. My well-beloved has a vineyard on a very fruitful hill. He dug it up and cleared out its stones and planted it with the choicest vine. He built a tower in its midst and also made a wine press in it. So he expected it to bring forth good grapes but it brought forth wild grapes. And now, O inhabitants of Jerusalem and men of Judah, judge, please, between me and my vineyard. What more could have been done to my vineyard that I have not done in it? Why then, when I expected it to bring forth good grapes, did it bring forth wild grapes? And now, please let me tell you what I will do to my vineyard. I will take away its hedge, and it shall be burned. And break down its walls, and it shall be trampled down. I will lay it waste. It shall not be pruned nor dug, but there shall come up briars and thorns. I will also command the clouds that they rain no rain on it. For the vineyard of the Lord of hosts is the house of Israel, and the men of Judah are his pleasant plant. He looked for justice, but behold, oppression. For righteousness... But behold, a cry for help. You know, if you think about that parable, now let's, leave, let's listen to what Jesus, the parable he's about to tell this gathering. And it says at vintage time, you know, first of all, in the ninth verse, it says a certain man planted a vineyard, leased it out to vine dressers or farmers or caretakers, whatever word you are familiar with, and he's gone for a very long time into a foreign country away from there. 
But he left it under their control and, and their, uh, left it under them to take care of it for him. Now, at vintage time, he sent a servant to, that, to, that, uh, to the vine dressers. He sent a messenger, so to speak, that they might give him some of the fruit that he's expecting now to come. Typically in those days, and, and maybe so even now, you can't plant something and expect to harvest the first you know, season. But we're probably talking about maybe the fourth season here of growing time and, and the cycle that he should be and could be harvesting some some fruit and some profit from his investment. But what happens when he sends the messenger to check out things? They beat him, the vine dressers, the farmers, the caretakers, they beat him and send him away empty-handed. Can you imagine the, the thoughts running through the owner's mind about why? Why are they treating my messenger, my servant, like this, and that's my vineyard? Well, Jesus was given a similar warning here to the religious crowd that was there, the Sanhedrin particularly, because he, he, was, he was referring to this, maybe, and, and sin, thinking back on in Isaiah. But listen, look at the verse, verse uh, 10. They beat him up, sent him away with nothing, nothing whatsoever to carry back to the owner. Verse 11, again he sent another servant, and they beat him also, treated him shamefully, and sent him away again empty-handed. Now, picture yourself. If you were the, if you and I, if we were the vineyard owner, and twice now we have sent someone to check on the, the progress of the vineyard, to check on the prosperity of the vineyard, to check on how things were going, and, to, and expecting something good in return. And twice, nothing but harsh treatment to those that you sent. You know, the, when Jesus was telling this, this parable, to the crowd there, uh, they abused the messengers. You know, they were wicked. They dished out uh, similar treatment that had been shown to God's prophets in the Old Testament. Some of those mistreated and abused. And yet, in verse 11, another opportunity was presented to those that were caretakers of his vineyard. If you want to see it in the spiritual light that Jesus was trying to teach, another opportunity to repent before the grace is exalted. And you know, today, if we looked at this parable, and I think this is what Jesus was trying to get the Sanhedrin particularly to understand is, there is a day of uh, offered of repentance, and God is merciful and he's graceful, just like this owner of the vineyard showing patience but there will come a day when patience is going to run out let's not stay today and waste God's grace and, and exhaust it because God does have patience he does have grace he is loving he does care but we can go past that we can continue to not listen we can continue to not heed we can continue to not repent and we will wear out our time of grace. Now, those three servants could probably have very well represented Old Testament prophets. Those hostile religious leaders, they represented the wicked tenants, or the wicked tenants represented them. Every way you want to look at this parable, they represented those that were rejecting God's call to Israel to repent in the Old Testament. And now Jesus is talking to him in his lifetime here, the very Son of God, and he's telling them once again a parable that they need to hear. Now, let's look at the let's look at the Son here in verses uh, I guess it's three uh, thirteen through sixteen A. 
Okay, then the owner of the vineyard said, well, what shall I do? He's almost at his wits end about what should I do. I'll send my beloved son. Would you and I have done that? Would we have risked that beloved son? Or would we have sent an angry hired army over there to thrash all them all out and get rid of them and re retake my possession again? But God, in his patience, was willing to allow his son, Jesus Christ, to come to this world, to live among this world, to show us his love and his care and his design of salvation. When this vineyard owner says, I'll send my beloved son, and he's thinking probably they will respect him when they see him because they will see the future owner. They will see my heir when they see him. That was his thought. Well, we could look at God the Father as the owner if we chose to, revealing his patience and his mercy. And he sends his beloved son, Jesus Christ. You see the misconception that the Israelite Sanhedrin and, and the Jewish religious leaders had? They believed they could love God and simultaneously at the same time hate Jesus. Think about that in your mind just for a moment. They thought, well, we're doing all the things that God has told us to do. We're keeping all these laws out of the Mosaic law. We're doing this and that. And even they had added many things to it of all men, man's thoughts, not God's. He didn't lay all those laws out that the Jewish people were trying to hold to at that time. But they're thinking, well, yeah, we love God, but we don't love the Son. That cannot be. That cannot be. You know, they, they misbelieved that they could love God and, and they were upholding his laws, but yet at the same time, they hated Jesus. If you looked again at that 14th one, look at the plot. But when they, farmers or vine dressers or caretakers, when they saw the sun, what did they do? They started reasoning among themselves. And they said, well, this is the heir. Let's just, come on, let's just kill him. And the inheritors, we ought to be able to inherit this place. Wow. You know, the, the more that you and I allow sin into our lives, the more polluted our thinking gets. And this is exactly what Jesus is saying here. How were they thinking we're going to become the heirs? You know, the, they were grasping at any plot. I jotted down a, a note for myself and for others. What greed and evil thinking. What greed and evil thinking. You know, like I said, if you begin to follow the leadership of the devil or his, his temptations... Pretty soon our thinking becomes so clouded we wouldn't recognize uh, very easily. We would not recognize the truth. And, and I'm afraid that the Jewish religious leaders had, had gotten to that point. Verse 15. They cast him out of the vineyard and they killed him. And then the question Jesus asks is, Therefore, what will the owner of the vineyard do to them? Well, this, if you look at that, it's a foreshadowing of Jesus' suffering and his crucifixion just a few days later. Just a few days later. There would be no excuse for those vine dressers or tenants or caretakers, farmers, whatever word you want to think about. God would bring down his judgment on, those, on that way of thinking. I like the first part of this 16th verse, and I want you to to listen carefully. Jesus says, He will come and destroy those vine dressers and give the vineyard to others. What a prophetic word coming right out of the mouth of Jesus. And don't let us forget it and don't let us miss it. 
First of all, he says, the owner is coming. Count on it. They had counted on the owner not coming. They're like, nah, he won't ever come. He's, he's gone off to the far country. He's not that interested. But Jesus says, yes, he will come. And what else does he say? Second thing, he says, he'll kill the wicked tenants. Wow. But look at number three. The third thing, he will give the vineyard to others. Aren't you glad, as a Gentile, that the gospel was shared to others of us Gentiles? We were included in the gospel plan. We could count ourselves as the ones that inherited, was given a gift just like this owner, we were given a gift that we had not originally expected. But yet the owner says, okay, you are now a part of this plan. The next few verses, 16, the latter part of 16 and going through 19, talks about the stone. And it being the title of the lesson as we know it today, the cornerstone. We need to look at that a minute. Let's go back to 16 and finish up that particular verse. <clears throat> and Luke says, when they heard this, Jesus says, about him giving the vineyard to others. Luke says, and when they heard it, they said, certainly not. Wow, how, you know, how accepting was that? They're just like, no, never. Never, never. Is that going to happen? Well, I ask the question, what about Pentecost? And what about the grafting in of the Gentiles in God's plan? Let's, uh, let's flip back to a Psalm of David, uh, 118th Psalm, 118. Flip over in your Bibles back midway, and let's read a little bit about what David is talking about. Psalm 118 and verse particularly 20, uh, 22. The stone which the builders rejected has become the chief cornerstone. Listen at 23. This was the Lord's doing. It is marvelous in our eyes. This is the day the Lord has made. We will rejoice and be glad in it. Did the Jewish people reject Jesus as the promised Messiah? Yes, we know that. For the most part, they did. Some did. Some didn't. They accepted him, but very few, as far as percentage-wise goes. They were not looking for a peaceful, love, compassionate Messiah. They wanted and expected a military, victorious ruler. When we think about when we think about the cornerstone, a construction site, think about a construction site. The Jewish religious leaders rejected Jesus as the Messiah, but yet he was the cornerstone of God's salvation plan. They did not want to relinquish any, any authority. They didn't, didn't want to relinquish any attention, or any control that they had over the people. They did not, you want to hear Jesus. You know, in verse 18, listen to what Jesus says now. Whoever falls on that stone will be broken. But on whomever it falls, it will grind him to powder. Interesting. You know, Jesus clearly taught that anyone who heard him, that he would be either their savior or their judge. Now think about it. He gives us an opportunity when the Holy Spirit touches you and I and calls us to Jesus to realize he's our Savior. We have a decision to make. We have a decision to make. I want to read you a little bit out of uh, 1 Peter. If you have a moment, flip to 1 Peter chapter 2. I'm going to read uh, starting in verse 4 through 8. I hope it brings clarity a little bit more. Peter's saying here, 
coming to him as to a living stone, rejected indeed by men, but chosen by God and precious. You also, as living stones, are being built up a spiritual house, a holy priesthood, to offer up spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. Therefore, it is also contained in the Scripture, and this is out of Isaiah 28 and 16, and, and Peter's uh, quoting it, Behold, I lay in Zion a chief cornerstone, elect, precious, and he who believes on him will by no means be put to shame. Therefore, to you who believe, he is precious, but to those who are disobedient, the stone which the builders rejected has become the chief cornerstone and a stone of stumbling and a rock of offense. You know, that's what Christ was saying here in that last part. You know, the stone which the builders rejected has become the chief cornerstone, and whoever falls on that stone will be broken, but on whomever it falls, it will grind him to powder. You know, we have a decision to make when the Holy Spirit tugs at our hearts and saying, you need a Savior. And that Savior is Jesus, God's only Son. There's not two ways or not three ways. There is one way, and that is through the belief in all of Jesus' work, his, his work and his message and his death and his burial and his resurrection. All of those things he came here to do for the lost. And if we don't accept that, then that same righteous God will at one day bring us to full judgment. Jesus was saying, I'll either be your Savior or I'll be your judge. Do you think the Sanhedrin and the Jewish religious leaders got it? No. I think they were more and more angry. I think each step of the things. You know, as Jesus on Palm Sunday, you remember the uh, when he was coming in to Jerusalem, the royal welcome that he got by the people, that, I believe that enraged those leaders. They were, they were already ill with him, and I think it just, their anger became red hot, if you will. But Jesus had gained popularity with the common people of Jerusalem, and there were people beginning to follow and believe in Jesus. You know, the religious crowd, their anger grew as the crowds gathered around to hear Jesus teach. And Jesus taught with authority that, unlike any other, they could not stand that. They, they felt threatened by that. You know, as Jesus was telling the parable here of the leader's evil motives and predicting their demise, he, he reminded them out of Isaiah, God sent prophets, and he finally sent his son here to this world preaching repentance, the prophets did, and his son providing a way of salvation. Do you think the religious leaders got it? No. No. Because they wanted, what did they want to do? They wanted that very hour to get, in verse 19, and the chief priest and the scribes that very hour sought to lay hands on him, but they feared the people, for they knew he had spoken this parable against them. You know, only the fact that they were scared of a, of a total revolt among the people did they back off at that particular moment. And they started devising deceitful and treacherous plans to still kill Jesus. You know, the, the, they got it in the sense that they understood that Jesus was who he said he was, but they could not, they could not allow things to go. Uh, they would not. They refused to repent. They hardened their hearts and refused to accept Jesus, except for a few. You know, and I, I jotted down my closing thoughts. Jesus is the cornerstone who saves or condemns, depending upon that individual that, that the Holy Spirit's calling, but depending upon the individual's response to his offer of salvation. 
You know, I pray that if you have felt that tug of the Holy Spirit and you didn't repent and come and profess Jesus and believe upon him, that the very next time you do feel that tug, that you would repent. Because just like this story, the parable that Jesus told in the presence of the Sanhedrin, just like that, you would have to understand that there will come a time when mercy and grace are exhausted. And there will come a time that you would realize that Jesus is Lord and judgment will ultimately come. So I pray that you would not continue to reject like some of these people did, that you would come to believe him and you would come in full knowledge and understanding that he wants to be your Savior and that he died for you and he died for me to give us that opportunity to live eternally in a heavenly place with him. I thank you for your time. I thank you for being. Come and be with us I, again. If you would, come and be with us here in uh, Sunday School Live on Sunday mornings or come and visit with us, especially in the worship time. Thank you.